everybody. We want to welcome you to church this morning. Let's stand to our feet. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone roll the way. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. Lift our voice. See his hands. See his feet. Touch his scars and believe He is risen, He is risen, He's alive
Good morning. Welcome to Hope. What, what a gr- Let's give God praise for that last Sunday service. How amazing was that? But we want to welcome you to Hope. I'm Pastor Paul, and this is... Carter. Carter Johnson. And just to remind you, the, the white roses represent first-time commitments to Christ. The orange roses represent recommitments to Christ. And we had a whole bunch of people doing both last Sunday. It was amazing. It was Easter Sunday. And here, here's one of the things that our prayer and desire, and no matter where you're at spiritually, and you're, we're all on a different spot probably on a journey, but our prayer is that we become fully devoted followers of Jesus Right, and that we learn to worship well, to connect well relationally, to serve him well, and to share the good news of Jesus to everybody else we meet. And so we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, we're going to have a baptism, believers' baptism service today. And again, that's for people who have committed their life to Jesus Christ. And we have a whole bunch of people that have registered already. But here's the deal. If you're feeling prompted to be baptized, if you've never been baptized before, or if you have questions about that, you can go to rooms, classrooms two and three at any point during your service, and uh, we'll have a team back there to explain that. And then at the end, towards the end of the service, we'll have the baptism service. And so, again, we're thrilled, absolutely thrilled that you're here. All right. Something coming up two weeks from today, April 21st on Sunday, we're going to be hosting New to Hope. So maybe you are just recently starting attending here, or maybe you've actually been coming for a while, but you just kind of come and go, haven't gotten involved or haven't really met anybody. So this is for you. Uh, It's going to be right after both services, uh, the 9 and the 1030. We're going to have some coffee and donuts in the Connection Center. We would love to get to know you and for you to know us better, uh, tell you about all about uh, why Hope is here, who we are, what we're doing. So if that's you, come join us. Two and everybody who comes today. gets a new car? Is that, no, I'm sorry. That's you not, get a car. That's, yeah, you get know, a car. Not, <laughs> we, we don't do the car thing. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> a donut. Um, you yeah. get a donut. Yeah, <laughs> donut and coffee. There no, it's you go. It's a great opportunity to meet the staff yeah. and do those kinds of things. One other thing, uh, and we have a couple other, uh, but during the baptism, if you can't see well, uh, we have space up here. We can do like a mosh pit. And you can come on up, and especially if you're little kids, right, come on up. If, you're, if someone in your family's getting baptized, you can come right on stage with them and do that as well. All right, it's going to be good. That's all we've got today. Uh, so as always, you can go online, go on the Church Center app, go online. All things hope. You can register, find all kinds of information. Uh, and with that, we're going to turn it back over. We're going to take our morning offering. Right? And for those of you online, again, welcome to you. And those of you in this room, if you're a regular attender and a member of this church, we encourage you to give boldly, like a- aggressively as an act of worship. If you're a guest with us today, please don't feel obligated. Let us host you in the presence of a God who we believe absolutely, absolutely loves you and believes that you are to die for. The ways to give are will be on the screen, and you can do that. And uh, it'd be just amazing to do this gift with a prayer that says, Father, thank you blessing me. May the Lord bless you today as we worship him. I'd love to invite you to stand if you're able. Would you pray with me, God, this morning as we gather, as we lift our voices in praise to you. God, we're in awe of what you have done last week and seeing the response of hearts and lives transformed. God, this morning as we do baptism services and see more and more lives changed, we offer you glory. We offer you honor. We offer you praise. And you're worthy of it all, Jesus. You are powerful and worthy of praise. Let's lift our voices together. Amen. close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one, hallelujah, holy, holy, God almighty. Great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, 
to the great I am. I want to be near, near to your heart.
sins are forgiven My future is heaven I praise God for what He's done Sing for the freedom He has won Even death is dead and done His life has Before Jesus was, uh, I guess a little context, uh, I accepted Christ when I was five years old, around there. Um, so I've known Jesus my whole life. Um, so what I can speak to is uh, being maybe in, in a phase of life where I wasn't uh, obedient or I wasn't following uh, Christ as closely as I should have. And uh, I can tell you that's, that's not a great place to be in. It wasn't what I wanted it to be at all. And it was, in fact, maybe in a worse place, being numb to uh, the Word of God. My life before Jesus was pretty typical. Um, I was raised um, in a really good home with really good parents. Um, I was living really comfortably. I was living the American girl lifestyle, so to speak. Um, I went to church every single Sunday, but I personally never heard the gospel. and. I never really knew that I had a sin problem or that we really need Jesus. So I was definitely my own God for 22 years of my life. I just did whatever I wanted. I thought we can do whatever we want on earth and we all get to go to heaven no matter what. And I never accepted Jesus as Savior and I didn't know I was supposed to. Um, so I did live my whole life with him not there. But looking back in hindsight, he definitely was there just by the grace that I'm still alive um, and that he did save me. But there was just lack of meaning, 
lack of purpose and then me going to worldly things for validation, um, dopamine hits, you name it, like just living the whole worldly lifestyle, going out, um, doing everything the media portrays as fun. Uh, a couple of reasons why I got baptized. Uh, a, in the Bible it says we, we should get baptized. Uh, it says that in uh, multiple places. Um, also baptism was, for me, it was a type of deal where I put it off for 20 years. Uh, I wanted to get baptized as a kid and just uh, due to several uh, changes in my church and pastors coming in and out of the door, I just kind of never, it was something I never really got around to. Since I was given the opportunity, I knew I wanted to do it uh, right away. It was, uh, it was so awesome to get it done and to be baptized. I decided to get baptized at Hope last October 15th of 2023 um, because I definitely just reading the word to me it was illuminated like okay repent and be baptized like I repented I changed my lifestyle he changed my life so I wanted to be water baptized in his name for my choice and my decision I was baptized as an infant and confirmed but I had no idea what that meant and I did not care so I I wanted to make that statement of faith publicly for myself as a born-again believer in Jesus and I just wanted people at Hope who were at that service or online to see that there are people in like Gen Z who follow Jesus and who love Jesus and this generation needs to see that you can be a young person and have fun and follow Jesus and enjoy your life and it's way better that way so I just wanted to follow what he asked of me and that's why I decided to get baptized at Hope. We talked last week that this week as we entered into this baptism service was going to be a continuation of the celebration that we saw happening on Easter Sunday and you hear these testimonies, right, of different people talking about their experience of coming to know Jesus and what their baptism meant for them. And it really is a celebration and an inspiration to all of us. As we get into the, the baptism moment of our service, I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce a new sermon series. And it, it's called a new work, which kind of makes sense when we're talking about baptism. But, but there are a couple of reasons we're going to introduce this as we go, and, and the primary reason is because of those words, a new work, a good work. Uh, from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I'm going to spend the next few minutes just introducing the book of Philippians. We're not going to get heavily into the text. We're going to do that in the coming weeks. But there's a second reason we're going to introduce the book of Philippians, and that is that as we tell the stories, we kind of unpack the background to this book, this letter that Paul writes to the Philippian church. There's a few truths that bubble to the surface, and those truths are really significant for today. Th those truths that we're going to get to, they, they really capture what's happening today, and they ought to inspire us. They ought to encourage us. They ought to be a point of celebration for us. They ought to motivate us to continue sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. So this morning, for the next few minutes, really, I'm just going to tell a story. It's in your scriptures. Some of it's not in your scriptures. It's in other history books. But, but if you're one of those um, fastidious, obsessive note takers, this isn't going to be real satisfying to you because there are three points. We're just going to talk about them at the end of the story, like really briefly. So I want to encourage you to take a big breath, put your pens down, even put your phones down, and just walk with me through this story. And then at the end, I'll remind you, if you have to fill in the blank in order to feel like you met Jesus on Sunday morning, um, I'll tell you when to do that. But imagine for a second you're sitting on uh, the couch with your spouse, and you're scrolling through all the different titles under, under Netflix account or your Hulu account or whatever you're using at home. And you're trying to pick a movie, and you find one that says the letter to the Philippians. That's weird. But you all go, oh, that looks good. So you click on it, and here's what I think would happen. As you click on the movie, I imagine the opening scene would be a flyover shot. It's a drone, and the drone is zooming in on what you realize is the ancient city of Rome, probably in the middle of the first century. 
but you watch movies and don't read books, so you actually have no idea what you're looking at. Thankfully, there's a subtitle on the bottom, and it says Rome, circa A.D. 60. And you look at your spouse and say, sorry, you look at your spouse and say, what the heck does circa mean? And your spouse says, approximately, you idiot. And now you got to go back 10 seconds because you missed stuff. So you go back 10 seconds, and the drone is zooming over the city. As it zooms over the city, you're starting to pick out buildings and places, and, and you realize that there are some palaces and some really fancy buildings, and then there's some smaller buildings that look like you know, government offices, and there's some really tiny ones that look like homes. And, and you keep zooming down the streets, and, and you see different people, a lot of Roman soldiers walking the streets. You see areas of wealth. You see areas of poverty. And then the camera zooms in on one building, which you immediately recognize as a prison because of the way it's designed. And it zooms through the doorway, down the hallway, and it settles on a lone figure in a prison cell. It's the Apostle Paul. Just outside the prison cell is his companion, Timothy. And Timothy's holding something in his hand that looks like paper or an animal skin or some kind of cross between the two. It's actually parchment. And Timothy is writing something, and you realize he's writing what Paul is saying. And then the music fades in the movie, and you hear the voice of the Apostle Paul. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all of the saints, the holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, now the camera stops, and it zooms back out, and it goes quick. You can see the whole city. You can see the whole country. You can see the whole earth, and you realize you get the satellite view. And then the camera moves over and starts zooming in on another city about 800 miles away. It's the city of Philippi, you later learn. And in the city of Philippi, the camera does something similar. It does a quick zip through the city. You see all kinds of people from every social class, from every background. You see temples, and you see idols, and you see shrines, and you see marketplaces. And you see people that look like they're priests or priestesses in some kind of weird religious cult that you don't really understand. And they look that way because, well, they are priests and priestesses of some weird religious cult. And now the camera catches up to one individual, and you can see that he's holding a letter in his hand, a letter that looks an awful lot like the one that you just saw in the hand of Timothy 800 miles away, putting the pieces together. And you learn that this gentleman is running through the city with this letter in his hand. His name is Epaphroditus. And you find out in the movie that Epaphroditus is a young man that the church in the city of Philippi sent all the way to probably Rome, to visit Paul in prison and take care of him because that's how they did it. If you were in prison, you needed family and friends to take care of you and feed you and, 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 and keep you healthy. And, and you find out that Epaphroditus went all the way to Rome on behalf of the church of Philippi to serve Paul, and he got super, super sick. Now you've got all sorts of questions, so you, you hit pause because you got to get your phone out, Google, figure out what this city of Philippi thing is all about. And your spouse looks at you, what, what, what? And you go, I, I, I got to find something out. She goes, well, I'm getting snacks. So your spouse leaves, and you go onto your phone, and you Google city of Philippi. What do you learn? Well, you learned it was named after King Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, about 300 years before Paul visited for the first time. You find out that several centuries later, it was actually ruled in the territory that Julius Caesar ruled, and that Brutus and Cassius assassinated Julius Caesar and took over, and then Mark Antony and Octavian, they, took, they had a battle, and they beat Brutus and Cassius, and then they took over, and then Mark Antony and Octavian couldn't get along, and Octavian defeated Mark Antony in this great battle called the Battle of Actium shortly before Paul had visited this city. Now your spouse returns with snacks, and you feel ten times smarter because you've learned all this, even though you know, two minutes ago you didn't know what the word circa meant. And you proudly hit resume. And we catch up with this Epaphroditus. We, we've learned that he got sent to Paul and that he got super sick and that he actually almost died, but then he recovered except that the church of Philippi only heard that he got sick and almost died. They never heard that he recovered. 
So you find out that Paul, in some sympathy, sends Epaphroditus back to the city of Philippi, the church that he had planted, and in so doing, he says, I want you to take this letter with you. So the camera now enters into a home, and in the home, there's a small gathering of people. There's a a woman standing there who looks like she's quite wealthy. She's wearing a purplish dress. And instead of Paul's voice, you now hear her voice reading the letter. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So much more in that introduction that we can possibly cover, but we'll dive into some of the deeper details in the coming weeks. But as you're watching the movie, now you get the prequel to the movie you're watching, because in the bottom there's a caption, and the caption reads, 10 years earlier. The story actually starts with a woman by the name of Lydia. Paul and Silas are on a missionary journey, and several times they tried to visit in several different regions, and for whatever reason, and however it happened, I don't know, but all the Scripture says in Acts chapter 16, by the way, is that the Holy Spirit stopped them. And ultimately, they had a vision, and they decided that Philippi was the place that they were supposed to go. So they go to Philippi, and now normally they would go to the Jewish synagogue and start reasoning with the people the Jewish people who had some understanding of faith and try to teach them about Jesus and show them that their faith actually led to Jesus. But for some reason in Philippi, there wasn't one, potentially. And so they're looking for people that they can share the good news of Jesus Christ who might hear it and be open to it. And they find a place of prayer down by a river and leading this time of prayer and gathering is this woman named Lydia. Now, Lydia was a maker of purple cloth. She she was probably fairly elite, probably fairly wealthy. Like, if you were trying to think of someone like this in today's terms, it, it might be a small business person that had done very well for themselves, and they ran a very good business that had lent them quite a bit of profit because they traded in some materials that were rather unique. You know, like if you were trading in stone tiles, those are common. They have them in our houses everywhere. But if you were trading in Italian marble. See, then, then you had a little bit more of a niche. And, and Lydia was a dealer of not just cloth, but purple cloth. And we, we find out that she's God-fearing and that Paul and Silas go to Lydia and they share the gospel with her. And there's something about that moment that helps her realize that it's not just God, but it's his son who offers the forgiveness of sins, that he rose from the dead And she surrenders her heart to Jesus. And we read that she not only surrendered her heart to Jesus, but she went home. She told her whole family. She continued to share the good news. And then her whole family surrendered their hearts. And they were baptized as a response to their faith. The second person that we come into contact with in the city of Philippi is someone we don't actually know an awful lot about nor can I tell you definitively that she fully surrendered her heart to Jesus and followed him for the rest of her life. We know some things about her. We know that she was a slave girl. We know that she was possessed by a demon. And we know that the people who owned her didn't care about her as a human being at all. They used her. The demon in her seemed to be able to predict the future, and so they used this slave girl to make money as she predicted people's futures. So she follows Paul and Silas every day as they go down to the river to visit these people and pray with them and talk about the gospel. She follows them day after day after day and she shouts, these men are servants of the Most High God. 
They are telling you the way to be saved. This is fascinating. I mean, just pause in the story for a second. Like, <laughs> do you ever think that God can't possibly use you? Like, think about this for a second. God in this moment is using a demon to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's mind-altering. Nonetheless, after days and days and days of this, Paul is rather annoyed. So he whips around and he says, in the name of Jesus, he commands the demon, come out of her. And the demon obeyed, rendering the slave girl just a healthy young woman with no ability to predict the future, and that's a problem for the owners of the slave girl. They can't accuse Paul and Silas of breaking the law, so they do what we all do. And if, if you can't really build a case, then sometimes you, you, you attack a person's character. So they played the race card. They, they brought Paul and Silas before the magistrates, and, and they accused them that because they are Jews and they aren't acting like Romans, they're going to they're gonna bring the city into disruption. Not really enough to get you punished for much, except in this case, it was just enough to get them flogged, beaten, whipped, and thrown into prison. But the slave girl, a young woman, miraculously healed by the power of Jesus, and, and I can't say more than I know, but here's what I know. I know she was healed. I know she was freed from demon possession, and I'm going to infer that she was invited to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that she was invited to join Lydia and her family, and become another member of this very early beginning church. Today, that person, that person might be someone who's deeply, deeply enslaved to some kind of entrenched, broken behavior. Likely, showing outward signs of being in complete slavery to something, some slavery to some kind of sin, addiction, brokenness, potentially devastating poverty because of a lifestyle, no indications that there's any potential of this individual even becoming a productive member of society, let alone a healthy member of the family of God. If you're painting a picture here, this is the person that you look at and you may not say it out loud, but inside your head, you're looking at this person, you're saying, there's, like outside of a miracle, there's no hope for this person. You almost don't want to invest because there's just, there's just no hope. And you're right. Outside of a miracle. Outside of the power that raised Jesus from the dead that is at work in all who will receive him. The third character we come into contact with is a jailer. He also sees the power of work, or the power of Jesus, I should say, at work in Paul and Silas as they are in prison that night. Paul and Silas are shackled in the prison, and as they're sitting there, surely contemplating the day's events, they do something unique. Turns out prison ministry started way before prison ministry started, because Paul and Silas host a worship night in prison there. They're praying. They're singing hymns. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being a prisoner there, kind of hopeless? All hope is lost. That There's two guys in there, shackled just like you, and they're singing hymns and inviting you to join them, and they're praying over you and praying with you and praying about you. And suddenly at midnight, there's an earthquake. And miracle of miracles, all of the shackles that are holding all of the prisoners break and the doors are open and everybody has the opportunity to escape. And the jailer sees what's going on. The, the person that's paid to guard them sees what's going on. And he realizes if these people escape, his life is over. His bosses kill him. So he just decides he's going to take his own life. And Paul says, stop. Nobody's leaving. Imagine a worship night... <laughs> That was so good that in a prison where all the doors were open and everybody's shackles were loose, nobody would leave because they'd rather stay for the worship. And Paul and Silas share the gospel with the jailer who's so overcome by the message of the love of God for him that he surrenders his heart to Jesus 
And he goes home with Paul and Silas, and he feeds them, and he takes care of them, and he tells the same story to his family, and all of them surrender their hearts to Jesus and are baptized. An elite businesswoman, a demon-possessed slave girl, and a jailer. I, in today's terms, the jailer is probably a middle-class worker, so a soldier, a guard, a law enforcement officer, but, but also an electrician, a plumber, a, a, a contractor. Like, I, I, you guys figure it out. I don't want to leave anybody out or insult someone. It, it's just everybody. The church at Philippi, around AD 60, made up of a complete hodgepodge of the strangest stories. And people with the wildest backgrounds, completely different backgrounds, completely different experiences of being enslaved to sin and free. Some looked like they had it together. Others clearly did not, but all with one thing in common. Having heard the good news of Jesus Christ, they surrendered their hearts and were baptized. Spoiler alert, here's an aside. If you put that many people in a room together and say, okay, you're one family now and you're all going to worship, you're going to have a unity problem because those parts aren't all pulling in the same direction easily. They are going to pull in all sorts of different directions. More on that later in the book of Philippians. But really briefly, okay, all of you note takers, here's where you can fill in some blanks. Three truths that bubble to the surface that should motivate us, encourage us, inspire us, to keep sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Are you ready? I'm going to get at them really quickly. Number one, God still changes lives. Last week we saw 70-some people walk across this platform and put a white rose up here. We saw 120-some people pick an orange rose and say, I'm going to recommit my life to Jesus and they put a rose in there. Just like when Paul and Silas shared the good news of Jesus Christ at the church of Philippi and it changed lives, God is still changing lives today. And he does it so often in response to you and me, those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, sharing the good news. You know what else is true? Maybe even better, God can still use anyone Consider these people, all of them Paul addresses in one simple way. He says to all of the saints in Philippi, there's so much wrapped up in that word. Maybe we'll tackle that one later too. But we have this idea, like we say things like, well, I can't do that. I'm no saint. Well, well maybe you're not, but maybe you are. Maybe you are a saint. You just don't recognize what Paul means when he calls you a saint. And all Paul means is if you have stepped over the threshold and you've entered into relationship with Jesus Christ, A, it had nothing to do with you or your effort or your incredible righteousness, and B, when you took that step, God declared you to be a member of his family, and you are a saint. He has called you and set you apart, and that's why Paul can say things like, go live in a manner worthy of your calling. God has declared you to be a saint. Live like it. And God does it with anyone. And thirdly, God still finishes what he starts. What does he say? I'll go back to the verse we started with. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus what you are today is not what you will be tomorrow. And the promise is that as long as you have breath in you, and as long as you leave your heart open to the work of Jesus, he will change you until the day you breathe your last. So don't give up. Don't quit. Don't give in. God has only started what he intends to do in you. I love Isaiah 55, 11. It says that the word of God does not return void. It does not return empty. In other words, when God speaks, it's impossible for nothing to happen. And if God declares you a saint and he uses his words, it declares that he will finish what he started in you, you can bet he will. So today, 
we celebrate. Today we reflect on what God has started. So if you're one of those people that's sitting here today and you said, I've already signed up for baptism, I'm probably wearing my t-shirt, I'm ready to go for baptism, you go ahead, slip your shoes off, put them in your seat, and come stand under the cross as we begin to celebrate what God is doing in your hearts. Don't feel awkward, you can just do that right now. But maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I'm not really sure I've stepped over the threshold. I'm not sure I'm a saint, not because God doesn't declare me to be one, but because I haven't made that decision. Today's a good time to do that too. If you're still wondering about giving your life to Christ, there are roses right over there. The white ones say, I'm making a first time commitment. The orange ones are saying, I'm already a saint, but I wanna step deeper into it and be more faithful. Feel free to get in line, grab one of those roses, and walk across the platform here and put them in there. Maybe you've done that, and you want one more opportunity to be baptized. It's not too late to do that in this service. So if you're sitting here saying, I've done all of this, and I just want to take the step like we saw on our videos this morning, I just want to take that step of baptism this morning, you can scoot out the back. The ushers will get you to classrooms two, three. That's just in the great hall on the left there. Someone will get you all set up, and you can join these folks that have already said, I am ready to be baptized. So there's a large amount of invitation for you. Will you listen to what God is prompting in your heart right now to make one of those decisions? Or perhaps just to join us, to celebrate. As these people come up out of the water, we're going to cheer. We're going to clap. We're going to celebrate that God is still changing lives. We're going to celebrate that God can use anyone. We're going to celebrate that God will finish what he started that is so obvious today. And we will go from here with more enthusiasm to share the gospel than ever before. Join us as we worship together. Lord, I confess
Sophie, do you trust Jesus for your salvation? Yeah. Have received him as your Savior and Lord? Yeah. Do you trust him alone? Savior and Lord? Yes. Do you trust Jesus alone for your salvation? trust Jesus for your salvation? Yes, I do. Have received him as your Savior and Lord? Yes, I have. What's your name? Alyssa Fulcher. Alyssa, have you received Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Do you trust Him alone for your salvation? Yes. We baptize you. What's your name? Layla. And if you receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord? I do. And do you trust Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. What's your name? Crystal Mendez. Crystal, have you received Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Do you trust Him alone for your salvation? Yes. What's your name? Iris. Iron, have you trusted Jesus for you as your Savior and Lord? Absolutely. Do you trust Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Yeah. Yes. Do you trust Him alone for your salvation? Yes.
there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. created in us. Father, we thank you for this moment. We pray that we will go from here with enthusiasm to continue sharing the good news of your risen son, Jesus Christ. As you go from here, my prayer is that God himself, the God of peace, will sanctify you through and through. That your whole spirit, soul, and body will be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you, by the way, is faithful. And he will do it. So go. Be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Let God love you. Love him in return. And love others in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.